tired of these strong voice. It doesn't say very much to the preacher. How about you? Do you need the mic? Third conclusion. There is a point of no return, and we're probably going to blow right through it. The point of no return is two degrees hotter than in Celsius, of course. Two degrees Celsius hotter than it was at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution 200 years ago. Um, we're about two-thirds of the way, not in current temperature, but in emissions already in the atmosphere that will cause temperature rise. We're already about two-thirds of the way to two degrees. The reason that is the point of no return is that that is the point at which we lose control of the process. At the moment, Human beings actually have full control over the process of global warming because it is our emissions that cause the warming. So if we switch out of burning fossil fuels, we stop the emissions, we stop the warming. The problem is political. I think it's very unlikely that the deals that are necessary will be made in time. And if we go through two degrees warmer, which is equivalent to 450 parts per million, plus a time lag of about 20 years before that 450 parts per million translates into two degrees hotter, then we lose control of warming because after that the warmth itself causes natural processes which will contribute to the warming. Feedbacks, they're called. The permafrost starts to melt around the poles, the frozen ground. And locked up in the permafrost is enough carbon dioxide to double the amount in the atmosphere. And you can't refreeze the permafrost. If you lose that, you lost it. Similarly, as the oceans warm, they lose their ability to store or dissolve gas. When a cold beer goes flat, if it warms up. So do cold oceans, warm oceans go flat. Somewhere north of two degrees, but not very far north, you lose control. That's the point of no return. And the next stable point in global temperature, if you look at the geological record, is about five degrees warmer. There are three stable climates on this planet. The one we're in now, the one about five degrees colder, which is what we have in the ice ages, and the one five degrees warmer, which we have not actually seen for about 52 million years. But it is a stable climate, and it leaves nine-tenths of the planet desert. I mean, we're, we're not in the business of saving the planet. That's just rhetoric. The planet will be fine. It's been all of these places before. It'll be there again. The point is to save us and, and, and the climate that favors our style of life. The core problem with the politics is that a small group of rich countries are responsible for almost all of the carbon dioxide that's up there now. We have raised the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere from 280 parts per million two centuries ago, stable for 10,000 years previously, to 385 or 387 this year. We're about 20 years away from the point of no return. So you have to move fast, and the whole world has to cooperate because if anybody undertakes the huge job of moving out of fossil fuels while other countries don't, the penalty you pay in additional costs 
makes you totally uncompetitive economically. Now that the Chinese and the Brazilians and the Indians and the South Africans and the Turks and the uh, Mexicans are industrializing and they are growing their economies very fast and they're getting their window air conditioners and their flat screen TVs and their cars, it's their turn. Their emissions will rapidly push us beyond the point of no return because the Europeans and their outliers brought us so close to the point of no return already. So you can't go to them and say, we're all going to take equal cuts. They know it was us who did this. We didn't mean any harm by it. We didn't know it was causing any problem, but we did it. And we are rich as a result of doing it, and they're poor. And they want to get rich, and we've left them no room in terms of emissions. So the deal that has to be made is very lopsided. It's a deal where the rich countries take very deep cuts up front. We still produce more than half the world's emissions. So if we can cut very deeply, we'll make a difference. Well, I'm talking about, you know, 50% cuts in 20 years, 100% cuts in 40, 35 if you can manage it. And the developing countries cap their emissions, they don't cut. And even after we make that deal, they've still got to be able to grow their economies. They don't want to stay poor. And so they've got to be able to grow their power generation. Growing your economy involves using more power. But all the new power they put in has to be clean. They cap their emissions. So they don't put in any more coal-fired power stations, cheap and dirty. They put in the wind farm, the solar array, even if they must, the nuclear plant. Who pays the difference between the coal-fired plant and the solar array, which is probably more expensive per kilowatt? And the answer is we do. The fair agreement is the lopsided one, which is ferociously difficult to sell politically, especially in the old rich countries.